today and welcome to Step Into Your Life with Julianne Williams. As many of you know, I devoted essentially my whole adult life and career to helping people in skilled nursing facilities and assisted living facilities um, in, in long-term care. Um, helping the elderly and firm was one of my missions because of my great grandma who came over from the Armenian genocide. Her name was Sermon Ihigian, and she was in a nursing home when I was little. And she really is my hero still to this day. And as I became more and more involved in the skilled nursing um, healthcare arena, I learned a lot about some of the debilitating illnesses that we were providing care to people who were in the middle of experiencing. And not all of them are well known and not all of them are well funded. In the end, every single person that I had the pleasure and privilege of being a part of their care team um, was a person just like you and I. And so it's really important that we learn about all different kinds of things that are out there that um, can affect our health on the long term. And today we have a, a really amazing guest, very incredible man who is named um, Dr. George Ackerman. His, he goes by, he is Sharon's son, George. Sharon uh, Ackerman, his mother, had the um, experience of Parkinson's disease. And um, Sharon's son, George, was her caregiver. He has now put out a really um, wonderful book called A Son's Journey, Parkinson's Disease, Caregiver to Advocate. And he's here to talk with us today about Parkinson's disease. Many people are aware of some celebrities that have it. I'm gonna let George tell us more about it, but I am so thankful to have you today because number one, um, you're such a lovely role model for people in terms of the caregiving world, the sacrifices that you made and what you've learned. And then the mission work that you're doing so that your mom, Sharon, is not forgotten, but also that other people will benefit from the experience that your family has had. So thank you for being with me today. Well, thank you. And it's an honor to be with you and your audience. Uh, we send our love and support always, but I think your show is special, extra special, not just because, uh, you know, we've got to speak before, but it really concentrates on an area that I think we need a 10 times more awareness for, and that's grief. Unfortunately, it's four years since my mother passed on 1 1 2020 due to Parkinson's, and I'm still grieving four years later. Uh, yeah. She was my best, yeah. my best friend, and I don't think there is a uh, anyway, I'll ever, you know, I feel like honestly, you'll probably be able to help me cope with this. But when she passed, a part of me also passed. A new part of me has blossomed in the world of advocacy. But, you know, there's uh, no seat at the table, unfortunately, for my mother at holidays and big moments in our lives. And this book means the world to me. And uh, I'm 6'2, 200 pounds in law enforcement. But when I talk about it, sometimes it's not easy. Uh, and I'm a big, I have a big mouth at times and I'm proud of it because I like to speak out and speak up for those who might not have a voice or those who might be kind of timid and shy. And I have uh, really set my life in the future in a positive manner to help be a voice for others in memory of my mother, but all those who we've lost, unfortunately, to the, due to the disease. And again, I feel like uh, there needs to be more with the grief community out there. I always say we have a middle, uh, a beginning, a middle and end of life. But unfortunately, the end is the one that no one talks about. And I love talk tackling those tough topics because my mother, in my opinion, was a saint because she was able to tackle some of the tough things like a will, even the funeral, a lot of things that would have been even more of a burden later on. But as we unfold the story, if we have the time, it wasn't, uh, you know, obviously always easy and uh, today I fight, though, for those who are diagnosed and those caregivers, but also in memory, unfortunately, of the millions of families who are still out there but lost their loved one due to this uh, horrible disease. Well, you know that I, my heart aches for you uh, for Thank the loss you. of your mother. And it does, four years is not that long. Um, so for people who are, are ex in the middle of their grief journey or have just begun their grief journey or 10 years into their grief journey, there is no timeline. And early grief is really the first two years. 
And sometimes, you know, five years is early grief for people. So we all have our own way of getting through and into our feelings around grief. So when you say it's only been four years, four years, or, you know, that's not very long. And mm -hmm. um, you're right. Each person that we lose has just makes a big gaping hole in our life and we don't ever get over it. And I, I remember how many, I can't tell you how many people told yeah. me mm -hmm. after my husband died, you know, you're going to get over it and you're going to find another nice man to marry, but it doesn't really work like that. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody is replaceable. Everybody is special. Sorry for your loss, but I still think what you're doing is amazing. And I think we still need a lot more discussion. So I, again, today is incredible, but it, I don't think this discussion ends today. It, Obviously, I'm going to share it throughout the world forever, but it has to be a continual talk until there's an end to this uh, horrible disease as well. I agree. So would you like to introduce your story and a little bit about Parkinson's so that our audience yeah. understands what it is that we're trying to get out there and advocate for? Of course, uh, my mother had approximately 15 years of Parkinson's. Unfortunately, the first seven I heard of the word, but I wasn't aware of myself, which is a part of the problem. Now, we don't know if my mother, uh, you know, just wasn't really aware either of how bad it could get. Or the problem is we've relied on several experts that said you don't die of Parkinson's, you die from it. But my mother had no other medical issues her whole life. Uh, and then if we get to the causes, we can talk a little bit. But uh, so she had it for 15 years. For seven years, she only had tough ability and stiffness in her left arm but it wasn't so bad where she had to have uh, you know someone watching her she still lived independently still drove she still met her friends you know shopped no problem unfortunately the four the last four years is when i had to take over in a way her life and uh, again i don't think i would be the man i am today if it wasn't for my mother's sacrifices so when it came time i was uh, honored to be there for her and i would do it all again in a minute even though it was very, very tough to be there and to see her go through this. Uh, so she went from being, uh, after you know those four years, the last four, somebody who could walk a few miles to a cane for two years, then the uh, walker, then a wheelchair and the bed down the last seven days. She said uh, so some of the other symptoms are, and this doesn't happen with everyone, so that's another problem why we don't have a cure. Everybody's so different. We have similarities, but nothing alike. She had a stiffness in her body, rigidity. So imagine somebody walking, but literally can't move. So your brain is kind of in your own head saying go, but your body won't function. That's another sign. Also dystonia and dyskinesia with the curling of the toes. So her toes kind of curled on their own. She couldn't, you know, it wasn't stop or preventable. And then uh, also the big one, which many people are aware of, Mr. Michael J. Fox, the famous actor, who has external tremors, and that's uh, one of the more horrific signs because it that's what kind of stops people from being able to have a career. They have to leave their jobs. They uh, some feel ashamed. Again, my mother, I'm not sure if she was ashamed or just in a way didn't want to burden the family, which I wish she did. So the reason I learned about all this and dived into it head first, like the book addresses, is uh she we tried everything, and unfortunately, finally she decided to try a trial at a university which i don't name because i'm not upset at the schools or the doctors it's not their fault i just hate parkinson's disease uh, that's the nicest way to say it without cursing and uh i have a shirt that says you know the letter f and then you can use your imagination for the rest of pd yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh that night she came home i don't know again i'm not a medical doctor she uh i think they might have changed her medication too drastically and i was called over to her house at 4 a.m uh, it was an emergency and I got there and I'm a, again, I, I'm my background to, as an attorney, police officer, now reserve and uh, as a professor and my PhD is in criminal justice. And I might have been trained million emergency situations, but never for this. I arrived at about 4 a.m. I saw my mother outside moving her furniture and I ran up to see what was wrong, not knowing what the heck was going on. She said there's Nazis inside and she's in fear of her life. So I uh, just was in shock and kind of didn't know what to do or say. Uh, mm -hmm. I rushed her to the hospital and found out that we she could have passed that night. So we saved her life. But unfortunately, that was where her health 
just kind of went on a downward spiral the next four years. And uh, it wasn't even that was horrifying. But then we realized she had late onset dementia. And I dropped her at the hospital. So I went back home to get her some clothes, thinking I'd just a quick get stuff and go. Well, to my shock and another part of why I still am haunted at night, I don't sleep many nights and grieving over this is her room is surrounded by post-it notes like we used to maybe remind us that we have a talk tonight. Uh, well, she had notes surrounding the room, like Beautiful Mind, the movie, and all in the, each note was names of people and animals that might have uh, had in her past, and she wasn't sure if they were alive at that point or there. And dementia, unfortunately, brought delusions and hallucinations that uh, not only complicated Parkinson but broke my heart. And that was the literal minute I knew that this is beyond me and I needed to help my mother in any way I could. So the next four years, unfortunately, I, I go much deeper into the book, which is I didn't really plan on writing a book, but I did write the last year I wrote a journal only to myself and literally wrote the date timestamp of what my days were like, and the pain, the suffering, the anguish, the grief and the little moments of happiness. But it was a, definitely a very tough time, and we wouldn't even have. I would speak for 12 hours. You wouldn't want me back. But so much to talk about, which is why I'm so honored that there's a book out there now that if people uh, do want to pick up, it's uh, just it'll tell you much more. But I do want to end that note with there is a lot of light at the end of the tunnel of darkness. Unfortunately, we no longer have my mother, but the people like you who have now inspired me and really uh, drive me to keep pushing for others is why I do this. And uh, I want to thank you again and your listeners for that. Oh, well, George, thank you. You know, it's really important for, I think, us to understand. So, and maybe you can kind of give us a feel, but you said some of the signs is the rigidity, uh, the curling of the toes, maybe some of those tremors. Is there anything else that people should watch out for where they need to consult their physician? Yeah, the main problem with Parkinson's disease is there's actually no test for Parkinson's. So what medical doctors do, and there are movement disorder specialists, but again, they, they'll take an individual, they'll do several tests for diseases and other problems, and then if it's not that, they're ruled out, and guess what, you have Parkinson's, which is not very efficient or effective. Mm -hmm. And the problem is we have many misdiagnosed people, we have late diagnosis, uh, and then if you're given medication for something you don't have, I mean, it happened the other day, somebody I know, they were told they have Parkinson's and now it's, they don't have Parkinson's and they're confused because they feel that they have Parkinson's and unfortunately you need to catch us early. Now we have no cure, but there are many ways we'll get to, I hope, uh, health uh, such as fitness and diet can slow the progression. So this is the fastest growing neurodegenerative disease in the world. So it's not just the U.S. There's approximately 1 million people in the U.S., but 10 million globally, which is uh, why two years ago I changed my thinking and I decided it's not just about my mother and I anymore. It's about everybody and how we're a family in this fight. And I had the honor of interviewing 600 people around the world from Spain, Japan, Italy, England, uh, France, uh, Iceland, Australia. And unfortunately, Parkinson does not discriminate it can get anywhere to anyone and uh, some of the reasons we don't think it's genetics but we do feel and i personally feel it's environment whether it's the water we drink whether it's the pesticides on the fruit we buy uh, my mother had a really nice home in uh, boca raton florida but for 20 years it had mold and termites and she had to have things sprayed who knows to be honest what the heck they put in it i am confident that's what did it so uh, now we try hard to you know live a life ignoring or, or not ignoring but trying to fight those things but it's not easy i mean as you know if you go to the shopping center it's they target a lot of us i mean if i see fruit there i buy it some days i forget to wash it well guess what there's a chance that that could have things like parkinson's in it and the shocking one last week a doctor i interviewed an expert in the field told me that even your dry cleaning and the chemicals. So now when I get my dry cleaning, I, you're supposed to take the plastic off, let it sit outside for a little while. The other day I forgot my clothes outside. I forgot all that. Oh, no. but, anyway. <laughs> but when he said it, I had a suit on because it was a really nice, it was a uh, speech we talked and I wanted to take the suit off and burn. It. <laughs> you know, oh, it's uh, a lot of things around us we don't even realize or unfortunately take the time. And one last thing is the most important thing right now is 
how uh, we need to talk about uh, it's not uh, elderly man's disease, Parkinson. We're trying to concentrate more today on females with Parkinson's because that's an issue that needs to be brought uh, out in the light a lot more. Uh, and also different vulnerable populations who don't have the ability to find, you know, movement specialists in their neighborhood. They did, uh, you know, and I'll get to advances later. Okay. Well, and that, to your point, I mean, a lot of medicine, and, and I don't want to get political or whatever, but a lot right. of medicine does center around a, a male's uh, physiology, right? Um, and that's just how studies are done and all that. But as we're learning, men and women have different ways of experiencing certain diagnosis or or coming about so i'm glad that there is some focus on that as a female i'm glad yeah. to hear that you know because um we we do need to take care of ourselves now um like you said you know i really am a fighter for grief and mental health those are my my mission work things that i do and so when i hear your story you know, obviously we're just connected because of the grief aspect and because it's not just the fact that you lost your mom, but you probably have a lot of grief over oh. things that happened before, um, uh, you know, that you, because you weren't, a, you didn't know because she was wanting to protect you or whatever her reason was. You probably have grief um, over the caregiving process. You have grief over the fact that she's not here. You have grief that your your um, your mission changed. You went from being the caregiver to then, you know, not sort of having to take those next steps because you're you were so all in. And then now you've gotten to this this advocate phase. And so when I think of you, I just you know, there's so much loss that I know that you've experienced, and I am so sorry that you have had to endure all of that. I appreciate it. And I also send my love and support for your loss. Uh, it means a lot to me that you were able to share with me. And also, like I said, people like you, I don't know about me, but uh, Mr. Michael J. Fox are my heroes because, you know, you have issues in life that are tragic, but instead of kind of, you know, not nothing against people who do, but we, you know, you have your voice and your husband still will always have a place in all of our hearts. And he, Mr. Fox, could have really, and there are celebrities who have, just kind of went on his life, never been in the spotlight. Or and He didn't do that. He fought back. He's raised over $2 billion, not $2 million. And he's, uh, you know, I had the honor a month or two ago to meet with him. And it was really changed my life. But unfortunately, even that day, uh, I felt so excited. But at the same time, heartbroken because i saw what it's doing to him he yeah. had young onset uh, uh, parkinson so he had it in his 30s uh, and also he uh, won an award recently and it was sad because it was the first time i saw they had to bring him out in a wheelchair and those are the things that break my heart and uh, hate you know i want this to end i want him to be healthy i want him to be able to not worry about this and uh, i love the michael j fox you know their slogan or mission says we're going to be there until Parkinson's is not. And that's uh, what I live by every day. And unfortunately, I have a lot of issues where, uh, like even caregiving and now advocacy, where you, the rule, like, you know, it's take care of yourself first or you're no good to the others, but I don't do that. And I don't have any regrets, but there are days where I'm, you know, like even tonight, everyone, it's Friday night. I'm sure we both have things, families and things, but we both want to put this in front and I've, it's sometimes been a struggle because even my wife, she's been my most incredible supporter. But we even had a talk recently that she thinks I'm doing too much. And I agree. But every time I take a break or rest because I have my own medical issues with my back, I think of everyone else out there still battling Parkinson's. And I say, you know what, I get my back. This is more important. And I just don't want anyone to have to, you know, I'll keep saying it, go through this disease or at least feel that they're alone because they're not. And I wish I had met you, you know, years ago because, you know, this is important stuff. But, uh, you know, I'm grateful that we had the chance now. I am as well. So, you know, when I think people have this vision of what Parkinson's is in their mind. Um, and to your point, it's so absolutely heart wrenching to see Michael J. Fox the way he is now, but also to be so inspired by the courage that he has had 
and the difference that he is making. And, and then, you know, people like you, that you have the firsthand experience with your mom and caregiving, it, it all, it all matters. Um, when, you know, when you think back to caregiving and for just a minute, I, as a, as a former, uh, healthcare person, when you were taking care of your mom, you know, what, how did you keep your mind in a place where you were, you know, could stay patient, stay kind. And, and also just, you know, it's just 24, seven, 365. It is so much more than even one person should be able to do. Yeah. I mean, it was uh, very hard. I even have a little passage I can read. It's on September, if you don't mind, uh, oh, September, 20, September 25th, 2019. Saw a mom today with the kids and she was a hundred percent fine and happy. After we left the nurse, we had AIDS. It wasn't really a nurse, but the nurse reported to me that mom lost it. It couldn't understand where she was, didn't know where she was going to live, and was delusional. Whenever she is with us, she's fine, but the disease is horribly fascinating, terrible, frustrating, and baffling. And that really just takes you into what I was thinking on that specific day. But uh, it was definitely not easy. I mean, I had like the world on my shoulders and I could take it because, again, I've gone through a lot of my own life experience, whether I wanted to quit, you know, law school, I wanted to quit the police, I wanted to quit the PhD, but my mother was always right by my side, pushing me to keep uh, fighting on. She didn't want me to be in policing, by the way, because it's so dangerous. And, I know. and my, you know, nice Jewish mom is the last <laughs> place you want your kid, even though I have like reddish blonde hair, I don't look like him. But uh, so she didn't like that part. But I mean, there were days where I, again, I wanted to quit, give up. Uh, I was angry, not at her, but at the disease. I was, I had, every time we had hope, it got crushed when something fell. We tried everything from massage therapy to physical therapy to chiropractor to needles for pain because she also thought she had my, fibromyalgia, which is terrible. And then the stomach was destroyed because of uh, the, uh, you know, the disease. And then uh, I swore and we kept our promise. We'd never put her in a home, but there were days I told my wife, I might go look at them, but I felt like I was betraying my mother. But, and then my mother was like the sweetest, kindest person I've ever met. Even she was very angry. And one time she took a little light and threw it against the wall and broke it. because she was frustrated at the disease and we didn't know it was going to happen. We were never told she was going to pass. She was only 69, which is so young. And I feel like we were really robbed, you know, for 10 years of her or, 15 years of her life and another 15 after so that mm -hmm. angers me but then again i i only reason i'm able to grieve and cope today is advocating for others and doing the 600 interviews was a change my life because now we see other people out there who don't they realize they're not alone and by posting their information and their journeys that inspires other people and uh now i've actually shifted the focus this book uh the son's journey was uh really dedicated to my mother, but for everyone diagnosed and those uh, caregivers alive. Well, I had an experience which wasn't very nice, which I don't know if we'll have time for, but maybe for the future, but I uh, just still feel alone some days. Uh, I'm not diagnosed with Parkinson. God forbid I could get in the future. We don't know. And I'm not a caregiver of someone alive, but there's some, there's a population out there like me who are people who lost a loved one due to Parkinson's and a lot of the organizations, I love them, but they don't have a seat at the table for me. And I feel that all those who we've lost their battle, it's not their fault, but they still should have a seat at the table and all the families still matter. And that's what the next book is literally already done. I'm waiting because I'm actually releasing four books on all the interviews I've done. We're working on a children's book in the perspective of a grandmother and the grandkids. Mm -hmm. And I have a, a groundbreaking one is uh policing and Parkinson because I actually have the manual for training because I was an academy teacher and they list the mention Alzheimer's, but they don't mention Parkinson. So guess what? If a police officer at two or 3 a.m. pulls someone over and the individual is shaking uncontrollably, that officer may be in fear of their own life safety and think the person might be intoxicated while driving or drugged. And guess what? It's not. It's Parkinson's and that can end very badly. So my dream and goal is to try to work with the Michael J. Fox Foundation and change the laws throughout the United States someday and implement the word Parkinson's into every police academy throughout the nation. That's something I'm going to probably start working on soon. But there's so much that needs to be done. We just don't have enough time. 
Yeah, and you, we do. When we're advocating, we have to take it one step at a time mm -hmm. so that we can be successful on each step and we can make that difference. You did make me think, though, a little bit about you talked about um, not having a seat at the table. The thing that's actually uh, that's going to be the name of the book. <laughs> oh, good. Hey, so it's perfect. Actually, I will remember that. It has two reasons. One is, again, uh -huh. I don't feel that. But the second, as we mentioned, is there's no longer a seat at my table for my mother due to Parkinson. That's right. And I, I love that that dichotomy of the thoughts of like the person not being here, but you you also not being there. You know, and it's interesting because in grief, that is something that does happen. Our lives change, um, mm -hmm. but everybody around us, their life stays the same. So for instance, as a young widow, what I found is I was no longer a part of all the young couples groups. Mm -hmm. But I also didn't have a lot of single friends because I was married for 14 years before my husband died. And so I immediately was taken out of that social circle. And then I was a single mom, not a married mom. So then I was taken out of that social circle. And then, you know what I'm saying? And so that's what happens. And then in grief, and then so you're grieving not only the loss of the person, but the loss of all of these connections. And I'm going to write a blog on this um, in the next couple of days, but really healing grief comes from connection. It doesn't come from time. Mm -hmm. And so when you're grieving and then all of these connections are taken from you, then that's exactly you. You do feel alone. And as a matter of fact, many times you are. And it's very difficult then to find that space to heal. And the reason I wanted to maybe tell a quick story is because this show is concentrated on grief, but I felt, uh, you know, so a few weeks ago I was asked, I got an email and as a lawyer, it's like, you know, you get an email, it's an ad, an invitation, and it was for some board uh, for the world of Parkinson's. I won't say who or what, because it doesn't matter. And again, I still support all the organizations. Actually, if you go to togetherforshrine.com, there's a donation link to the Parkinson's Foundation and Michael J. Fox. All that is actually nothing to do with us. They've all really been nice and created a link in my mother's memory. So oh. if you donate, it goes to them. So we do not accept money. So everybody listening, we love you. We want you to know we support you, but we don't want any of your money. It sounds odd because 2024 is always, but wait, there's more like Shark Tank, <laughs> but there's no more. <laughs> I just want you to know you're not alone. But uh, so I get this email, the quick story, and I'm writing in depth and I'm providing all of it in my the last book I probably ever do is it might be a little controversial, but I'm going to break through the walls if I can. I really want all these organizations to have a wing for people who've lost a loved one. They don't have anything right now, in my opinion. So I get this email it says, you know, do this essay. So I literally sat for three hours. I had my PhD hat on, my, you know, and I wrote three pages, APA format. I had references. I even put videos and so much stuff. And I figured I'll send it in. If they don't see it, at least they know I'm out there and good. That's it. I don't even want to be. Yeah, if I don't get it, who cares? There's a lot of people. So I, uh, you know, I'm done all excited because it took, poured my heart into it. I press the button. Well, guess what? There's two choices, not three, two. One, you have Parkinson's. Number two, you're a caregiver and literally says the word alive and says no three. So my heart sunk. I felt grieving and I felt like my mother had just passed away again. And it really like kind of broke my heart. And I wrote a 200 page book in a week about that and all the experiences I've gone through as an advocate, because I do want uh, everyone to know it hasn't been easy. We've, I've had some, I even had a person, which I'm sharing everything. I had, I had to hire a lawyer, even though I'm a lawyer a person. And two weeks after my mother passed away, I tried to find support on Facebook groups, which was not always the best thing. So this one person who I didn't know thought I was some woman scamming people, which I don't know why, because I don't ask for money. But they actually took my profile page and wrote like fraud, put it online. I had to file a lawsuit. I got it to stop. But they said I wasn't real. My mother never passed away. And here's a guy, you know, just lost his best friend. And I'm like literally and falling apart Thanks. and angry. And it was horrible. So I'm putting all of that in the book. but. The lesson from everything I do like that is no matter a troll, someone you love or anyone, never, ever, ever let somebody stop you from fighting or doing what you believe. Because I was uh, I've had doors shut in my face like this little example with the, uh, uh, you know, the survey or the paper. But instead of, you know, just giving up, fading away, 
we've now built together for Sharon.com into its own world. I mean, when I started, I thought three people would see, and I would have been happy with that. But we've had 40, it says on there, 40,000. It's like a little counter, but over mm -hmm. 40,000 people have visited the site now and just growing. And sadly, I don't know if it's growing for my work or that the disease, unfortunately, is growing. And more and more people I'm hearing are being affected, whether it's a neighbor, a cousin, a mailman, a truck driver. And, you know, that might be why so many more people are finally getting involved. And finally, last, uh, again, I don't have a lot of hope when you talk about politics because everybody's always arguing but and sadly it's a good and a bad but last december for the first time in u.s history the united states uh, representatives they actually the house passed the first ever national plan to end parkinson's disease it's the first bill in u.s history i was a part of it that i spoke with my representative and now it's actually hopefully heading to the senate in the next year or two so you and your uh, listeners can please contact your senators and urge them to support the National Plan to End Parkinson's Disease, sponsored by the, and uh, really pushed through by the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And it's really the only time I can talk to you live and or record and say that you can be part of history. And it's bipartisan, which is beautiful, because anyone who doesn't want to cure for the disease, I, that's a different conversation. I won't get involved with <laughs> So t speaking of that, so what what are the new advancements in in treatment for Parkinson's? Yeah, the biggest one is because of again the research and funding by the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and I'm getting on the work with them and just a supporter. But they have something called the biomarker that was found last year, and it's changed the world. Unfortunately, it's still very evasive, so it's a needle that you can have in your spine. And they believe you can determine if you have Parkinson's. But for someone who's had two major spine surgeries, I don't think, and a third one coming in next month, I don't think I'd want that. So what their real goal is to take that and then next year or soon to be able to offer it in a shot like a blood test and have it in every single office and every doctor in the world, or at least in the U.S. And that would really, that would change the world because now if you know you have it, you can do things, you can make changes, but again, it doesn't cure it. So we still have a long way to go. And I even say once this bill passes, if it does through the Senate and the president, whoever it is, signs it, that doesn't mean they're going to implement it perfectly. So there's going to be still a lot of work to do. And just nice to know that that's coming. Unfortunately, again, it's not any, it won't help me and my mother, but it will for so many others. But I still would have liked the sentences. You know, there's actually like 10 pieces of it. It'll help fund research. It'll help those diagnosed. It'll help the caregivers. It'll help population too. But there's still nothing even in that to help the grieving and the people who lost loved ones, which is kind of something that, once again, I can't comprehend. I do understand that they don't want to hear a lot. Like there's a chapter in my book, I always say to skip, which is the final week of my mother's life because it's tough. But, uh, you know, I do have a lot of good things and positive to say. I don't always have to talk about the sad part, which I don't. But I uh, even as a guest, uh, like like tomorrow, I'm going to a symposium. We have a table. They don't ever I, I speak a lot, like uh, I've probably done 60, you know, speeches and things. But I don't ever get asked by organizations to give speeches at their events. And part of me is OK with it because I'm tired at these. <laughs> I'd rather speak to the people like uh, I wouldn't be able to do well, but. I, it's going to be in the, the other book, but it is interesting that I'm a professor, and again, I still have a lot to learn, but I'm a professor, you know, lawyer, and I, I speak, but they don't ask me to speak. So that's one question I'll leave for you in the audience. Yeah, you know, I think um, the topics, when you start talking about topics that aren't, we'll say, pretty, right. that's where, you know, you kind of get sub, mm -hmm. you know, just sent out to the side because in our society, and even in the mm -hmm. world, but especially in our society, we we like to gravitate to the topics that are fun mm -hmm. and make you feel good. And, you know, the puppies, the puppies and the bunnies. <laughs> yes. And you know what? All those things are important because we need happy things in our life. The right. issue, though, is that we have not normalized the fact that things do happen and that grief is out there for everyone. And that we all have to help each other, like I would just said. You don't heal from time, you heal from connection. But until we normalize the conversation that says, I I it's okay for me to ask you about your mom Sharon. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, her name is probably music to your ears. Yeah, I mean the 
Yeah, the main thing is really this was all about her. That's why sometimes I don't even want to talk about me because it's not about me. Uh, she sacrificed again a lot. She was a school teacher. She had a master's degree, and she literally gave it all up to raise me and my brother, and I don't ever forget that. Also, I don't think I would have, uh, you know, the time management skills, the planning skills, the caring skills, and I do forget a lot of times to tell you that uh, I've been an officer since 2006, I'm actually called a reserve because I do it all voluntary. So you wouldn't know the difference if someone pulled you over. Not that you ever pulled over, but you know, any. <laughs> oh, I didn't know, but I, I'm sure I, I might, I might have been in the past, but only just for maybe going a little too fast. Well, my family thinks I'm nuts because you know how many people would put a gun badge on completely free, go into very dangerous areas for free for decades, and. I don't ever really talk about it much, but I did. I would have put my life on the line. I still would for a stranger if it would help save them or help uh, change the child's life or an uh, elderly person being neglected. There's a lot of that. And that's just something, again, my mother raised me, uh, morals, ethics from her. I left law firms because they were doing shady, unethical things, and I could have made millions, but I said, I'm not. that's not me. I teach ethics today because of that. But you know, there's just a lot of things she instilled in me that I hope I can instill in my children. But I just believe in helping others. And if there's someone who my favorite part of the policing world was serving, uh, you know, Thanksgiving to the uh, people who didn't couldn't afford it or the less fortunate or driving Santa Claus to the kids for tots, you know, toys yeah. for tots. Those are my memories that I love. And now it's really even more dangerous, unfortunately. But you know, I feel you have to give back at some time to uh, change the world. And now I shift to uh, this world, which is I love because, you know, again, I met some incredible people. Not everyone opens the door, but I, I'm the kind of person that pushes the door open. And, you know, my goal, again, is really just good hearted. It's to help find a cure. But I think if we had more awareness that we would have already ended this disease. And till then, I just, in my heart, I don't feel I can stop like tomorrow. I mean, how many of us uh, want to sleep? You know, we don't get much time during the week. I'm working 24-7. Uh, and then Saturday comes around. I'm going to be getting up at 6 a.m., putting on all my together for sure. And sure, we just got putting, following up the car and driving to a symposium to talk to hundreds of people just about mom and you know, our journey and ju uh, we have people come up to me and they hug me, they cry and they, you know, it just changes my life because I love virtual because I meet incredible people like you and your audience, but, you know, being there live is also amazing. We're in Parkinson's Awareness Month this month. We had World Parkinson's Day on the 11th, but to me, Parkinson's Disease Awareness is literally 24-7 until we find a cure. But then again, we talk about the downhill and that's my own health because it's got, you know, even now I would usually used to work out every day. I don't do it as much because I think they're just more important things like ending this disease, but that's not always the you know smartest. <laughs> yes, so, it's true because you yeah. have to take care of yourself. You have three babies that need yeah. you, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You no, know, but what you're doing is I just admire uh, the tenacity that you show each and every day as you're doing this work. Because, um, you know, I commented on a, a thing on Twitter the other day, which probably wasn't popular, but someone was complaining about something. And I said, well, it's always fine unless it's you're the you're the one person that has that problem. You can dismiss mm -hmm. anything you want until you learn that ever, so many people are affected by this problem. And so I really think that we have to fight to show the world all of the um, ways that we can help one another and mm -hmm. and what you're doing for Parkinson's, I just really am just so proud to have you, you know, talk with me about it today, because again, it's something not only from the grief standpoint that's near and dear to my heart, but for my career of working in skilled nursing. Um, if I, I saw many, many people at the end of life, um, and I've saw many, many people with Parkinson's and it is not an easy disease to live with. So I just am really proud to be a part of, of your movement. And I do want to thank you for being a police officer. I appreciate everything all the police do for us. And we would not have our country if not for them to keep us safe and uh, to do all the wonderful things that they do for our communities. And my nephew happens to be a police officer and I know how much he loves it because of making a difference. So I just so much appreciate all of the roles that you have taken on in life. And I know your mom is proud of you. 
because she did raise a really amazing man. So we're, I just hope my son is like loving and caring as you. No, so. I appreciate it. I, I still have a lot to learn. And, uh, and my mother's funny. If she was with us, she'd say, George, don't do the shows. Go spend time with your family. But then I would tell her I can't do that because I love them. But they also have to They understand that this is a mission. And we saw, again, Parkinson's disease doesn't take a break or a time out. So I don't feel that I can. And, you know, the big thing is I don't have it. So, you know, I don't know some days people, you know, they almost challenge me like, why are you doing this? Or you don't have, but that's not what it's about. If we all join together, work together, learn together, then I, again, think it would be over. But until then, I still think there's a lot of work to be done. Well, you are making a difference each and every day. And I am so grateful uh, that you are on the show. And um, like we talked about, my last question, I always ask everybody, and this is not going to be our last show, but um, no, I appreciate so I'm thinking of answers for this. Uh, but with that said, um, what did you do to step into your life with your grief and loss? And how have you been able to transform? Yeah, I think that, again, I, unfortunately, some people you go through a very, very life changing situation and you might, you know, treat it differently. But I decided to take it head on full force. I didn't want my mother ever to feel alone. I knew when I was there by her side, she at least uh, for a moment could know she was safe. Like that was my biggest thing. I never wanted her to feel, you know, I mean, there were some times she thought there were even aliens in the room and people harming her. Thankfully, she know, she always knew that when me and the children, even though they were screaming, <laughs> they were little children, but uh, she loved it. Like that was, a, we even had a room. We bought her a whole new home. She never got to enjoy it. Unfortunately, it was the last year. But there was a room dedicated because we're really clean people but that they were allowed to destroy it was the kids room so mm -hmm. she loved going in there and sitting even though when she was sick we would bring her in the wheelchair and she would just watch them and you know she smiled she loved sundays blowing bubbles in the backyard with her grandkids and that was the one speech i gave it was only two minutes during the michael j fox foundation to my representative for the national plan to end parkinson's and i fell apart this is today when i walked by this you know backyard I don't see that anymore. And that still uh, haunts me too. But uh, what I did want to say is that you need to take the tough times, never let the, uh, the those, you know, like Parkinson's can never take away the memories. Like we started with my book, the cover is my mother and I at uh, my wedding, which was one of my favorite days in my life besides when my children were born. But that was the time where in those few moments we danced, we laughed, we just talked and joked and it was like nothing else in the world existed but that moment. And even now it's hard sometimes to even look at the or talk about the cover, but that was literally uh, what meant the world to me that moment. And you can see she's actually shining because she's smiling. And, oh, you're uh, make, I, you are bringing tears to my eyes. <laughs> but anyway, so that's something that you have to, you might have challenges and, uh, you know, things, obstacles, but you have to fight through them uh, and just keep fighting. And now I fight in her memory. I do have a little quick statement. I always say at every end of anything I do, if you don't mind, uh, this is to you and to your uh, viewers. And this is, I'm sure, us together. But we love you. We support you. We care a lot about you. And you're never alone. I will advocate, along with uh, my friend, the co-host here, Nurse, uh, I will advocate for you. And together, our voices are so much stronger. And I'm just getting started. And I say that because, obviously, I've been doing it for a little while. But... Every time I meet somebody like you, impacts and changes my life for the better. Every time I speak to, you know, viewers or get comments or emails that, you know, they're struggling and they just want to thank me for being out there. That's what kind of re motivates me and makes me want to keep fighting. So, again, I'm just so grateful for our time and hope this does continue because I think, again, grief is something that is out there but not talked about enough. And we have even I have a blog with a young uh, a woman who she actually lost her husband from Alzheimer's the same day I lost my mother from oh. Parkinson's. Uh, obviously, she's older. Her name's Betsy, and she's become like my best friend. And we uh, we started a little blog. It's called Tackling Tough Topics, where we actually talk about you know medical marijuana, uh, Death with Dignity Act, which we didn't have in Florida, and that's another show. We don't. My mother was tortured the last seven days. She had a heartbeat. It didn't even breathe, like didn't didn't move, didn't nothing. So she couldn't even acknowledge she was alive. And Florida doesn't have any law. We treat our animals better than our loved ones, and that was you know the toughest 
days of my life, seven days just waiting to, because again, we didn't know she was going to pass, but then we had kind of had an idea. Uh, that was tough. And one last thing is if you go to togetherforsharon.com and you scroll to the bottom, there's a video and it's, I've been playing guitar half my life just for fun. And we have music therapy for my mother, but someday she was too sick. Well, a week before she passed, I believe, some reason, I don't know why, but I decided, why don't I sit down and play with the music therapist and you'll hear her singing and me playing guitar with her. My mother was there, but we don't show her because she wasn't doing well. Uh, my mother at that point didn't really speak anymore. She couldn't, but we played memory, well, memories from the, the Broadway show Cats. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and my mother used to bring me to the Broadway a lot, and I was able to see Cats with my mother. And that was her favorite song. So we actually got a chance to play Memory. Um, you know, we've recorded it. And the only thing I could tell you is uh, at the very end, my mother somehow was able to say thank you. And she loved it. Those were the last words she ever spoke. And that memory, unfortunately, you know, we'll never be able to relive it. But we have it now on this website. And those are the kind of things that I believe that TogetherForSharon.com is about. Again, we're a completely free and not a foundation and just one person one son who lost his best friend, who is mother, and I never want her to be forgotten. So again, just grateful for you, your family, your time, and your audience. And again, we send our love to. Thank you so much. And we do. We remember Sharon Riff Ackerman today as we do this interview in her honor. So we are doing this today in her honor. And so thank you. Um, so as George said, if you want to find uh his website, it's togetherforsharon.com. We'll link it at the bottom. I'll also put his Instagram on because he's got some really great posts um, that I've really enjoyed looking at and I think you can learn from. And then anything else, George, we'll, we'll link down below so that people can get the right resources. But this is such a very important topic and I am grateful that you took a Friday evening with me and uh, we will definitely talk again. So everyone, thank you for joining. Step into your life and we will journey together. 